So I'm going to introduce uh, Ron Alterman. He is the uh, member of our group. He's the chair of the Division of Neurosurgery here. He is a preeminent and internationally recognized expert on surgical therapies for Parkinson's disease, has an enormous experience in deep brain stimulation, but also has an interest in other potentially emerging new approaches to treating people with devices. So his title is DBS and Beyond Surgical Treatments for Parkinson's Disease. Are these for me? Ron? Thank you, Dan. And so uh, if we can switch to, the, uh, to my laptop for the video to start. Excellent. So uh, I know Dr. Tarsi mentioned this, so you can see the spot. I or the quality of life for millions of people suffering from Lots this disease. Lots of emails about disease. this over the, when, uh, at the when early September yeah. when it came out. This is what Parkinson's disease does to Kimberly Splatter, uncontrolled movements, shaking and wobbling. It got to the point where I was having difficulty getting dressed. I have a grandson. I couldn't, like, snap his onesies. I was at a wedding recently, and I couldn't dance with my dad. It was sad. Parkinson's is a degenerative disease of the nervous system. There's no cure, only treatments to ease the symptoms, including the most common treatment, an old medication that causes its own set of side effects. With time, it seems to be less effective, mostly because the disease just progressively gets worse with time. But now, doctors at the University of Maryland Medical Center are experimenting with a brand new treatment, something that's never been done before. It's called MRI-guided ultrasound. It's been known for a long time that if you make lesions in certain parts of the brain, you can eliminate some of the uh, symptoms. And that's exactly what this treatment does, except there's no cutting and no surgery. Patients are put into a special MRI machine so doctors can get a close-up view inside the head. Then ultrasound waves are targeted to a specific part of the brain that's connected with the uncontrolled movements. Dr. Howard Eisenberg is Kimberly's neurosurgeon. But making the lesion is not, not destroying the cells that per se are causing the symptoms, but it interrupts that part of the circuit and then the symptoms are relieved. Kimberly underwent this treatment less than a week ago. She says she had to shave her head, but the procedure didn't hurt. The only feeling is intense heat. The results, though, were immediate. She was able to walk. It was just absolutely the most incredible thing in the world. And when we met Kimberly this morning, there was even more emotion because she was able to accomplish something else, running a favorite hobby that she hasn't been able to do for years. It's turned back the clock for me. You know, I, I have a new lease on life. I can do things that I want to do. I, it's a blessing. Pretty amazing and very, very rare for medical researchers to see something they're testing produce immediate results like this. So they're very excited. Kimberly was the first person to undergo this treatment, so doctors have no idea yet how long the results will last. But they have done some testing on people with tremors, and those treatments are holding up about a year later. So that's a very hopeful sign. We'll keep an eye on this one. It's, really good news. it's wow. exciting. Huge. Miraculous. Okay. So. Uh, I, I give you that as an introduction. No, 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 I'm going to stay on the, on the laptop for, for a couple more seconds. So just to, to show you, this is a classic example, right? What do we know about this? We know that it's been done. Sims Furniture's oh, Columbus Day Sale. 40% off the entire... Exactly, exactly, right? Marketing. Okay, so with all due respect to my uh, friend from the, uh, the Boston Globe, uh, uh, well, I guess NPR, but who said that the Boston Globe doesn't uh, do these sorts of things. Brain surgery that's not invasive, experimental procedure with, with uh, th this is a device, the same device as at the Brigham. No, I said I didn't. Oh, you didn't do that, okay. Uh, and then you see on the left here from the company that makes this, Partners Healthcare announces disruptive dozen technologies, and that includes, Insight Tech is the company that makes it, includes their technology. They don't, of course, mention that Partners has invested $2 million to install this system in at the Brigham, and they're still looking for a good use for it. So <clears throat> we can now switch to, uh, uh, to my slides. So, so this is the problem that we have, and I was just talking to Dr. Tarsi about this, about how compelling the prion story is. The reality is that 
from the initial observation from Brock and now this latest study on vagotomy in, in the Danish patients, it would very likely take 25 to 30 years or more before that basic observation could possibly be turned into a therapy that will benefit anybody. Okay, so it's not something that is going to to happen tomorrow. It takes years, diligence, lots of studies, lots of trial and error. But that doesn't jive with the impatience of the public to have new breakthroughs and the 24-7 news cycle, where you constantly have to have new medical breakthroughs to talk about. It, the two just disconnect, besides what goes on on Wall Street and in the private sector with talking up new therapies because that jacks up your stock price and then you can sell out before the whole thing collapses, right? So the problem we have is this disconnect between the, the plotting nature of science with occasional serendipitous breakthroughs where you suddenly stumble on something and most of the great breakthroughs in the history of science were matters of serendipity where you found something when looking for something else um, versus the need for the public and the fact that the press and the media, the, the internet pushes this, this impatience for these new breakthroughs. And so that's right there, that's the message of my, of, of my, my talk. But let's go on. Uh, we'll have a little more fun. And I just want to say I'm about to open a Pandora's box of things, and I don't want you to become too discouraged. In the end, at the end of Pandora's box, the last thing that came out was hope. And in the end, there's always hope and understanding that lots and lots of work and well-meaning people who are trying to do the right thing and trying to get to new therapies and ultimately cures for Parkinson's disease. And I really want that to be the, the final message. But until then... Um, I always like to start my talks off with quotes of one of my intellectual heroes, people not whose shoulders I stand on, but whose lead I follow. And I think this is very important. Uh, what people tend to forget, everybody knows Descartes, right, said, I think, therefore I am. But the first clause of that was, I doubt, therefore I think. I think, therefore I am. Uh, and so Descartes is really the father of modern skepticism. Uh, and um, when I, I, I learned about him in my Intro to Philosophy course at, uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I, I, uh, he became one of my heroes. Um, so, you know, every day the media, as I said, bombards us with miracle cures. Dr. Oz, of course, is our latest, greatest snake oil salesman. Um, <clears throat> yet uh, he still makes millions of dollars and still has uh, viewers despite how many times he's been embarrassed for uh, promoting um, truly snake oil. Hmm, not advancing, here we go. More importantly, we do have a scientific reproducibility crisis. This was uh, The Economist from a couple of years ago, very influential article, but there have been more a lot recently in the New York Times, um, mostly around um, psychology studies that are not reproducible functional brain imaging studies that are not uh, reproducible. There's one famous um, functional imaging study. It's called the dead salmon study, where a scientist was able to take literally a dead salmon, put them into a functional MRI, and show brain activity in a dead salmon. Um, so, so entire fields, the, the quality of the work being done in entire fields is currently coming under fire. And so we're not just talking about Parkinson's, or I don't want to talk about just the part what's going on in Parkinson's disease, but it's part of a broader problem in the field. Uh, this is a very important study. It was published in PLOS One this year, which looked at the, the economics uh, of, of uh, irreproducibility. And so th these are reports, a summary of reports from different pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies are giving up on the basic science they're reading in top journals because they say, oh, that looks interesting. We might be able to develop an important drug based on that, and they can't reproduce the results. This is costing billions of dollars. It's now estimated from that same paper. Half of the $56 billion we spend on medical research in the United States each year is going to, to try to reproduce irreproducible basic science results. And this is the design, these, these are the, the sub areas of that $28 billion that we're wasting trying to reproduce those results. Okay. In addition, we have skyrocketing scientific attractions. So these are people who are being forced to retract papers that they had published, often in prominent journals. And you can see that half, nearly half of it is due to misconduct outright fabrication of results, self-plagiarism, meaning republishing results you've already published elsewhere, 
and frank plagiarism publishing other people's results. Only about a quarter of it is honest error, and then the rest of it is irreproducible. Okay? All different symptoms of the same problem. Now, we also have a mathematical issue, and we're going to get into a little statistics. I'm going to try to walk you through this, okay? But the way we do science is flawed, and this goes, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Dr. Ioannidis uh, later on, but he pointed this out. This is from that, uh, that Economist article, and just so you understand, so let's say in the real world, uh, out of a thousand theories that are being tested experimentally, 10% uh, or 100 are actually true. Right, that, this, that the results of the experiment will be positive. Now, if we set a p-value of 0.05, that means when we say that a p-value is 0.05, which we consider to be scientifically, statistically valid, it means that, there's only, that it, there is a five, still a 5% chance that the finding that we're seeing is due to random occurrence and is not actually true. However, so those would be false positives. So you have to take out <clears throat> so you have to add in the false positives. You take out the 10% of false negatives, so things that are true but they turn out not to be true in that experiment. And what you end up with is about a third of studies that are being published as scientifically true with a p-value of 0.05 are actually false. So purely from statistics, the, what we accept as what is statistically true in scientific journals already give us a, a, about a 30% chance that what you are reading is not true in the real world and needs to be tested. Okay? Statistics works. Okay. So, but we also have these other driving forces which drives up that percentage of studies that are, get published that are not true. There is increased competition for scientific funding. This is due to slowed growth in the NIH budget increased focus on private sector funding, which of course is looking for profit, and it's harder and harder to separate yourself from the pack. So there's a need to get things published. On the medical side, that's the, that's the basic science side. In addition, on the doctor side, slowed growth in fees paid to physicians for providing direct patient care leads many to seek fame and fortune in the development of breakthrough treatments or, like Dr. Oz, to simply get yourself a TV show, right? If you're good looking and well spoken, you can get yourself on TV, thanks to Oprah and you don't have to worry about taking care of patients anymore. Uh, and so the real money, quite honestly, is in consulting and the development of intellectual property, right? And so doctors at, major doctors at academic centers, that's all they want. They want that one idea, that thing they can patent and sell that patent or develop a company. Just to look at the NIH budget over time, these were the Clinton years when things were good and money was going up. We had a budget surplus, then the Bush tax cuts, things stayed flat. We had the financial crisis, so this was part of the TARP, right, the AARA, uh, the uh, American Recovery and Something Act, uh, which boosted, which, which Obama, President Obama put a bunch of money into, the, uh, into scientific research, but here we are again. So things have been flat for about a decade, um, but more and more people are competing for those dollars. Okay. We have a problem with publication bias. Positive results are easier to publish than negative results, particularly in prominent journals. People don't like publishing results of, oh, this didn't work, even though that that's just as important for other people to know about. And more importantly is that an early false positive study published in a prominent journal, like the Lancet or the New England Journal, small study, wow, this looks great, it will take a good 10 negative studies in lesser journals to overturn in the public's mind and in other doctors' minds that that result, that initial result, was actually false. Okay? And it may lead to expensive, as I'll show, blinded trials that ultimately overturn that early result. And this leads to what we call significant opportunity costs in economics. We talk about this. While you're spending time and money doing one thing that's not fruitful, you could have been spending that time and money doing something else that was more fruitful. So there's tremendous opportunity costs for the doctors for, and the researchers, for the pharmaceutical companies, and for the patients because patients are entering trials where they might have to wait a year to get their final result when they could have been doing something else. So we have to be much more careful about what we take to these longer, uh, larger expensive trials. And then again, the 24-hour news cycle, the public has a thirst for medical breakthrough stories, the lay press knows this, the Tuesday Science Times is just notorious. Uh, the Times actually, the upshot in the Times actually looked at, I couldn't find the article, I really wanted to show that of, of the lead articles 
in, the, in this Tuesday Science Times, how many of those actually, over the course of the last 10 years, actually turned into actual therapies, and it was less than 1%. So every Tuesday, the New York Times is telling you about these great medical breakthroughs. Mo you know, most of them are going nowhere. Uh, CNN, of course, my, my dear colleague, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, another one of my favorites, uh, is another one who, who needs to constantly be telling you about new medical breakthroughs so that he can stay on the air. <laughs> Um, and not have to take care of patients. Uh, <laughs> that's hard. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, we have poor study designs, right? Failure to control for placebo effects uh, and observer bias in early clinical trials. Uh, I'll show you a paper that I published on this. And, and studies notoriously have, have inadequate statistical power to prove what they're trying to prove. And then there's publish or perish, which we all know about. And I'll be honest with you here, uh, you know, I'm standing here in, in Harvard, I'm sure that the, the walls will start tumbling down on me. Though, though it's preferable, being correct is not the primary measure for academic advancement. Generating publications, renowned for both you and the institution, and research dollars. These beautiful glass buildings are built on indirect costs, right? It, the money that goes to the university for every grant dollar that you get, okay? They don't care if you're right or wrong. They care if you're bringing in research dollars. Ultimately, if you're wrong, you'll be found out, but by then. Also, donors like a good story, right? It's very hard to get money from, from big donors unless you can tell a really good story about how you're changing the world. They want to see return on their investment uh, in, their, in their philanthropy as much as they do in business. Uh, and in the private sector, as I said, one can become quite rich selling intellectual property even if the therapy doesn't pan out in the end. So you want these really good early studies and then sell out to a big pharmaceutical company for your intellectual property for a lot of money and let them worry about whether or not it actually turns into a therapy. And I can tell you, a lot of people have done this. Now, getting back to Dr. Ioannidis, um, he published this paper in PLOS One entitled Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Um, and just, uh, it, it's a very, <laughs> His statistics, he's, he plays on a different plane than most humans in terms of his understanding of statistics, but these are some key points to take away from his paper. And I think these were already mentioned by, by Mr. Knox. The smaller the study, the less likely the findings are true. Small ends, don't believe it. The smaller the effect size, the less likely the findings are true. The greater the financial and other interests and prejudices in a research field, the less likely the findings are true. So who's publishing it? What's their bias? What do they get out of a positive result? And the hotter a scientific field, meaning more people involved, more competition, the greater the number of teams involved, the less likely the findings are true. So what he's saying is that forgetting what I showed you in terms from the, the Economist article about a third of the, of the published studies being false, just, just at baseline because of the way we do science and what we accept as being true, when you put in all of these driving factors, the competition, the money involved, the fame, the number's gonna go up. And you've gotta be very, very careful about not getting too excited. All right, so where does that leave us with Parkinson's disease? In addition, in Parkinson's, as you know, there is a profound, yeah, there is a profound placebo effect, just based on the biology of Parkinson's, because placebo is mediated by the dopaminergic system. The reward system is dopamine mediated. So the expectation of getting better from something means that your brain dopamine will go up and therefore your Parkinson's will get better. So more so than almost any other disorder, Parkinson's and placebo are, are, are intertwined. And we must, we must be very, very careful about that because it bites us on the butt all the time in this field. Classic paper by John Stossel um, the, not the John Stossel on TV, the John Stossel at uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. So this is a, 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 a PET study, okay, and this is the patient at baseline, and this is the patient. So what, what they're doing here is they're giving, they're looking at raclopri raclopride binding, right? So CLR and raclopride competes with dopamine. So as dopamine levels in the brain go up, raclopride gets displaced, so it would be less. So what you see is that just giving the patient a placebo means their brain has produced more dopamine and the raclopride signal goes down. Okay, and so there it is, the biological basis for placebo effect in Parkinson's patients. Chris Getz, a number of years ago, published uh, this study looking at placebo response in Parkinson's disease, uh, comparisons amongst 11 trials, and the key was the overall placebo response rate was 16% with a range of zero to 55%. Patients with higher baseline UPDRS scores, so the worse your Parkinson's, 
Um, and studies that focused on PD with motor fluctuation, surgical intervention, sound familiar, folks? Or those with higher probability of placebo assignment showed increased odds of positive placebo response. Also, the bigger the intervention, so I do surgery, right? If you've committed yourself to a surgical intervention for your Parkinson's disease, your placebo effect is going to be more profound than someone who's committed to being part of a placebo-controlled medication trial, right? Because you're putting yourself at risk. You've got to believe this is going to work. And your belief that it's going to work for you means that it will work for you to some degree. Okay? I participated in a couple of the uh, gene therapy trials for Parkinson's disease, and I will tell you, the first go-round, when we broke the blind after more than a year from the surgery, the patient who had done the best was the sham patient. Okay? And he would not believe me when I told him a year later that I had not injected anything into his brain. He would not believe me. So. Did he nosedive? Yes, he did. And there is, there, I, I do believe a bit in the, no, in the nocebo effect, right? So the nocebo effect is the opposite, is that if you randomize, if you're, told you're, if you're then told you didn't get something uh, that you wanted to get, that you'll actually do worse. So we've gone through this. How am I on time? Okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we've gone through this a number of times, what I, what I call biosurgical therapies for Parkinson's disease. So these are surgeries to implant biologicals to try to alter the course of your Parkinson's disease. So we've done embryonic human fetal tissue transplantation. We've done that twice. We've tried embryonic pig uh, porcine mesencephalon twi uh, once, intrapatamidal infusions of glial-derived neurotrophic factor. Dr. Uh, Tarsi, I know, touched on that. Uh, that failed. Uh, retinal pigmented epithelial cells on gel gelatin carrier beads. AAV nurturing twice, I was part of that, AAV GAD. All of these have had a very similar, it's not just that they failed, but they've had the same pattern of failure. And it wasn't even placebo effect that was the key. And let me take you through this. So, so this is the paper that we published at Annals of Neurology with, uh, with my dear friend, Dr. Olano. And what I looked at, and this was after we had gone through the first uh, gene therapy trial, and everybody was talking about the Parkinson's effect. But what was more profound to me was this. If we look at the initial pilot study, again, small numbers, okay, but look at these percent improvements, right? Huge, right? They're like, oh my God, we're going to cure Parkinson's disease with this. But look what happened when we went to the placebo controlled trial. So this is now, so now we're based on this. We just, oh, let me go back. Hit the wrong button. So based on this, we power a study. Right? We say, wow, we're going to get a 40% improvement in the patients with Parkinson's disease, so we can do X number of patients, and we're going to do this number of sham and this number right, who are actually going to get the therapy, and we're going to say they're going to have a 10 to 20% uh, placebo effect, but if we get this 40% improvement, we're going to be placebo going away. Right? Makes sense? Okay. We then do the study, and look what happens. Yeah, there was a placebo effect, right? 32%, 10%, 20%, 20%. But look what happened to the active group. Forgetting this, this study was a joke and no one ever took it seriously. But look at these others. All of a sudden, your, your response is half of what it was in the open label trial, in the initial trial. So it's not placebo. Well, placebo's there, but we can control for that. But it's that the, the therapy suddenly didn't perform in the blinded trial nearly as well as it did in the initial open label trial. And this is repeated. So what we postulated was this, right? Is that, so if you have an observed clinical response, patient comes to see a doctor, doctor gives the patient a pill. You have an observed clinical response, they get better. There are three components. There is the true biological response. That medication changed that patient's physiology and they improved. There's placebo response. They got better to some extent because they expected to get better from the, from the pill. They wanted to get better. They expected to get better. They got better. But in addition, in an open-label trial or in a standard encounter with your doctor, there's something called observer bias. The doctor is biased, especially if it's a new therapy from which the success of which would make this doctor rich and famous. He wants you to be better. He's going to rate you differently, right? And, that's going to, and there's going to be an interaction there between the doctor and the patient. Now, we further said in a positive trial, right, so if we, if we go from a, from a positive pilot trial to a positive blinded trial, this is what we should see. We should see this sort of a response is just an arbitrary number, let's say a 60% response when we give this 
therapy. And then in the blinded, you're going to have this, you're going to have the placebo, and then the rest of this will be actual clinical response. It'll be a little bit less, and that'll be the observer bias, right? That would be a therapy if this is what we want to see when we go from a pilot study to a blinded study. Now, there are two different ways we can get a negative blinded trial. Again, the open label trial. Here, if we have profound placebo effect, then everything we saw in the open label trial was placebo, right? And very little biological effect and very little observer bias. But if we have significant observer bias, then the therapy suddenly performs just like the placebo because the, the raters are now blinded to what the patient got, so they can't subconsciously cheat, and this is what you have. So what did we have when we put all of these therapies together is that in the pilot trials, we were getting about a 35% uh, average response. And in the blinded trials, 12.5% versus 17%. So basically, what we're looking at is not a placebo problem, although the placebo is there, but we can control for it with the blinded trials. It, the problem is observer bias in the open label trials, in the initial pilot trials, upon which those large, very expensive, long-term blinded trials are, are based. And so the message of that paper was we need to go back and we need to start doing the initial trials better, which of course no one's learned that lesson and we've now repeated this a few more times in other fields, uh, in other, uh, other areas of functional neurosurgery where uh, observer bias was not controlled for in the initial trials and, uh, and then the trials completely failed. Uh, what about stem cells? Everybody's very excited about the potential for stem cells. Um, for treating Parkinson's disease, and here's my take on it, has always been, we're taking the cells from this, right, from a, from a fetus, an embryo. Now, the embryonic brain is a very different environment than the brain of an elderly person with Parkinson's disease, right? There's very little myelin um, in, in that brain, uh, and so there's a favorable environment for these cells to make the appropriate connections uh, and regulate the system. Uh, and so I think it's really an enormously tall order to think that we're going to be able to take cells out of this brain and put them into this brain, which is a very, excuse me, very different environment, and think that those cells are then going to miraculously uh, change the course of Parkinson's disease. I may ultimately be proven wrong, but they've been at this since the early 1990s, and we don't seem to have made a whole lot of progress. Um, so again, I don't want to be too disappointing. I hope somebody proves me wrong, but I, I, I am less... Um, enamored, especially when you look at the Brock um, classification, as has been mentioned, and see how diffuse the process is, simply putting dopaminergic cells back into the patamen, I do not think is going to be the answer to Parkinson's as a whole. But I could be wrong. Uh, it's been mentioned, in addition, again, uh, this was actually the original paper, was Jeff Kordauer's paper, which was published before the uh, 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 the Swedes paper on Lewy body-like pathology in long-term embryonic nigrostriatal transplant. So, so some of the cells do get incorporated. Um, we had more problems with this than, than benefit, but long-term when patients died, they were already showing evidence of the pathology. Again, evidence that it's a problem with the environment that the cells are being put into, not necessarily the cells themselves. It's not that the cells are dying because of something wrong with the cells. It could be that those dopaminergic neurons are dying because of something that's going on in the environment. And if we put fetal cells into that area, those fetal cells will also degenerate because the environment is toxic for whatever reason, whether it's a prion uh, or whether it's something else. Now back to my favorite uh, uh, focused ultra ultrasound. So the arguments in favor of HIFU, what you saw earlier, right, and this is the device, you put your head in this thing, uh, in the frame, is that it was, it's quote unquote lower surgical risk, right? No incision neurosurgery. No incision, no burr hole, no brain penetration. It is therefore minimally invasive. And there is greater patient comfort uh, there's no, there are no long-term hardware issues. That's very true. Uh, the device you have uh, implanted, and we have a number of my patients here, uh, and that there would be reduced cost because the implant itself is quite expensive. And these are DBS's shortcomings. Cost is the major one. There is the infection risk of having the hardware implanted and long-term hardware concerns, uh, concerns about having MRI. It is invasive. We do have to pass the electrode down through the brain, although we've gotten a lot better than that. I just celebrated my 10th anniversary without a single brain hemorrhage, knock on wood. Um, and, uh, and, and the patients 
for the most part, don't like awake surgery, although for the most part, people can get through it. But why is DBS superior to ablation? What they fail to keep mentioning in the HIFU story is that it's ablation. You're destroying brain tissue. And we used to do that in the mid-90s. I did a lot of pallidotomies and got the same result. Young people running down hallways. We all appeared on TV in the early pallidotomy era, right? We, we moved away from it to deep brain stimulation for a reason. And the reason is the irreversibility of the lesion. And that's not changed. You're still making, and this is what they fail to mention in these stories, you're still making an irreversible destructive lesion in the brain. And if that lesion is not exactly in the right place, you could have terrible consequences. And that's, again, why we move to deep brain stimulation. It's reversible and removable. We can adjust, adjust it over time, customize it to you. Bilateral procedures are safer. They don't mention that either, that you can't but lesion the brain bilaterally safely, no matter how you do it. So it's still only a unilateral treatment for Parkinson's, which is a bilateral disease. Okay. We get greater insight into pathophysiology through the recordings that we do. We can develop new stimulation paradigms over time and an ability to record from the target. And therefore, it also lowers the risk of experimentation in terms of doing surgery in patients we otherwise wouldn't. Now, what about the, 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 the patient comfort? You saw the lady's entire head had to be shaved. DBS, we do. I like to, but we don't necessarily have to. Head frame, yes. Not necessarily. There are ways of doing deep brain stimulation without the head frame. So that discomfort, um, which is the part that pa patients probably hate the most. Scanner time, 20 minutes when I do a DBS. You're in that scanner laying flat for two to three hours before they localize the target and then ablate. Are you awake? Yes, you have to be. Symptom relief, unilateral, unilateral, or bilateral. So I would submit and have in debates with uh, Jeff Elias, who's the major proponent of this technology, that it's not more comfortable for patients at all. It does eliminate the incision. Uh, and again, we went from, this was a beautifully done pallidotomy by me back in you know, the 1990s. Uh, but again, I couldn't offer this patient pallidotomy on the other side, whereas I can very freely offer bilateral deep brain stimulation um, uh, now for Parkinson's. So to me, HIFU is, or I should have used my Yogi Berra slide. It's deja vu all over again since we're in a, a Yogi Berra mode as a Yankee fan. Uh, uh, and again, we've, we've, we've already compared, at least certainly in Tremor, deep brain stimulation. Uh, and Ron Tasker, uh, one of the grand old men of, of, uh, of Parkinson's surgery from the University of Toronto, right, wrote, wrote a paper way back when, deep brain stimulation is preferable to thalamotomy for tremor suppression. Okay, the flexibility of tremor control, complication avoidance makes it superior to thalamotomy for treating tremor. Comparison of thalamotomy to deep brain stimulation, this is the, the, the very productive group out in Kansas. Bill Kohler at the time who was one of the early proponents. Although the efficacy is similar for thalamotomy and DBS, thalamotomy is associated with a higher complication rate. And the complication rate wasn't the passing of the probe, again, it was the making of the lesion. And then finally, in a paper published in the New England Journal, um, uh, again, thalamic stimulation and thalamotomy equally effective for suppression of drug-resistant tremor, but thalamic stimulation has fewer adverse effects and results in greater improvement in function. Um, we're going to have many technological advances to deep brain stimulation, which they will not be able to match with ablation. will be new leads that will allow us to steer current, smaller devices, rechargeability, segmented leads, MRI compatibility, increased durability. So we have we have an enormous upside in terms of technological advancement that can be made in deep brain stimulation, which you really don't have with ablation, because ablation is ablation. Oh, I, this is a joke. I'd written a haiku for haifu, which is safe brain ablation, no incision needed, true, but it's still a lesion. So I would say in the end, view new breakthrough therapies with great skepticism, especially open label studies involving very few patients. I would say, unfortunately, restorative therapies for Parkinson's disease are likely many years away. There are enormous hurdles we have to overcome. If you think a new therapy is right for you, ask your doctor uh, and, and, and keep hope alive. There are many new things being tried, and eventually something will work, and never underestimate the power of serendipity.